This conference will now be recorded. The um, um, uh, Scoliosis Research Society, of course, is uh, um, you know very uh, very big into the global alignment over the neck. Uh, we we typically speak less about it unless you're part of the CSRS. But I think everybody agrees that uh, bringing these people back upright when you uh, when you deal with the osteoporotic older patient population that we typically care for, um, they come in with uh, not just the neurologic symptoms, but sort of unknowingly, right, how their head has gone forward. And if you ask these people, hey, if you have a picture from 10, 15 years ago, what do you notice? Well, everybody agrees, right, that they are more forward and they would like to be a little bit more upright. They usually have a lot of neck pain from uh, from holding their head up as it's like a bowling ball on a stick that's uh, slowly started to lean forward. And I think if you don't take that into account when you do these reconstructions, you do, uh, you do your patient a disservice by just getting the pressure off the nerves but not getting them back upright because nature is not mild and the next 10 years is really tough and then there's some good evidence that adjacent segment issues and so on are propagated by us not doing a good enough job getting these people uh, getting these people upright so i think um there was a need for this and um and and so far using it clinically it's been extremely useful um, and I wanted to share some of that with you guys after we talk about the details of the technology. Again, uh, very thankful for everybody who's joining and, um, and, and hopefully you'll get something, uh, something useful out of this. Um, the agenda is, uh, is, is in three parts here. The main part we're going to talk about is uh, hijack anterior cervical. As you can see on the left side, there's a bit of an introduction about the uh, technology. Then we'll talk about some clinical uh, outcomes and then there's some room for questions as Brad alluded to. Then we'll talk about the V3 plating system, which is uh, independent but sort of integrated with the with the hijack it's a guided system of very easy plate placement and uh, perhaps a light bulb might come on that instead of having to do a three or four level plate it might be helpful for a variety of reasons um, uh, to uh, to perform individual segmental plating and we'll talk about some pros and cons uh, about that and then lastly um, to combine these things together for uh, reasons of biomechanical advantages we'll talk about there is hijack um, standalone hopefully coming out later this summer which incorporates basically a plating system with an expandable cage and uh, i think the biomechanics look really good on this and, uh, and i'm excited about uh, the relatively straightforward solution with this that offers us something that is uh, maybe technically a little bit less challenging than how we sometimes do these reconstructions um, so moving uh, moving forward, um, the hijack AC, the, the anterior cervical component, uh, is is running on a video there on the left side. As you can see, there's an expandable device with a very solid core, and then there is a um, a lifting mechanism inside of this that allows the superior and inferior end plates to expand here as you can see into lordosis there is an adjustability of two and a half millimeters anteriorly there's also a millimeter and a quarter posteriorly and up to 20 degrees of lordosis can be dialed in depending on the size um, of the implant that's chosen what I really liked about it, and, and you see this a lot in expandables, right, is concerns about bone fusion, but the graft chamber is very uh, desirable here. Um, the end plates are also participating with the fusion process because of the technology that's on the surface, and we'll talk about that. And then what I like a lot uh, clinically now is that uh, we have the ability to post pack it through the center, and in the middle you see a small picture of it being placed, and you see there's quite a generous center here, and it allows you actually through a funnel, and uh, I'll show you some pictures of that, to pack the inside of the cage and then there's some sort of an expansion if you will of that bone graft material from the center of the cage into the uh, space where the end plates are meeting that graft chamber and uh, you can really put some nice pressure on the bone graft that's in there. I think the best part is that I typically don't use Caspar pins for my distraction. I don't want to drill additional holes, especially if the patients are osteoporotic. And I use this um, relatively small, we call it a grasshopper, right? A little laminar spreader in my disc space. And sometimes when I take that back out, the disc space collapses a little bit back to its original height, right? After you do your discectomy and decompression. And then having to hammer something in there is, uh, is, is, at least in my book, not desirable, especially if patients have adjacent myelopathic levels where there is maybe a three level scenario where the spinal cord is really tight. I wanna avoid having to hammer any kind of implants in there and have a very controlled way of basically dropping this implant in there and then expand it and the beauty is that I'm not committed to having it go to so many clicks, right? There is an infinite and continuous expansion mechanism in the um, end plates that are uh, coming up from that center core. And it allows you for uh, dialing exactly in where the neck needs to be based on uh, your intraoperative um, uh, appearance, of course, of the level and also your preoperative planning. 
as I alluded to, there are zero to 20 degrees of adjustable lordotic angles, depending on the implant that you pick. It's zero to seven, five to 12, or 12 to 20 degrees. And the two and a half millimeter continuous anterior um, expansion allows you to have these different sizes available. And, uh, and, and thus far, I have not met uh, a level that I could not place uh, uh, like the perfect size of my, uh, my implant in there. The beauty of this is too that as opposed to having uh, say a static wedge right that may be hyperlordotic that once you put that wedge in there maybe the anterior height goes up but posteriorly you do not benefit from additional indirect decompression and I really like that in these people I, I try to do a really good decompression with getting the osteophytes out of the foramen and so on but sometimes it's really nice as you guys know even with a static cage if you have a little lift posteriorly and what you don't want with a hyperlordotic cage is that you squeeze basically the foramen closer by expanding the front and then the foramen becomes the fulcrum. So what I like with this is that I deliver the cage and when I expand it in the back, there is a little bit of height restoration also that gives the room uh, a little bit more breathing room for the nerve root coming out there. Um, there's two different footprints, 13, 15 and 15 by 17. And as I said, so far, I've not met a spine that I could not comfortably instrument with this. Um, so moving ahead, I think <clears throat> what we all see, right, when you start to use these uh, titanium 3D printed cages or so with these serrations, as you can see in the monolithic example in A here versus the expandable, I mean, they look and smell sort of the same. However, the way that you place them is very different. If you look at these hard foam blocks here, where we mimic a disk space here on the left hand side and then place both a static as well as an expandable cage, you see that both cages have exactly the same geometry. However, the static cage here is only able to restore 6.7 degrees of lordosis versus the expandable cage. Once we place um, the um, end plates against the hard foam, you basically press up against it and you don't lose anything from serrations that scrape off part of the end plate. And <clears throat> what that bone looks like, in this case depicted by hard foam, you can see below where in the space here where the static cage was placed you can see that there is abrasion of that static end plate against the foam blocks and this allows actually for some of your loss of lordosis as well as some abrasion of the end plate when you hammer this in there that could give rise to subsidence in patients that have uh, osteoporosis obviously And this is in stark contrast with um, looking here at the uh, expandable variety where the foam blocks are in perfect condition still because the end plate has been nicely pressed against the um, bony end plate um, depicted here by the foam. And as you can see here on the right hand side, any of the sort of surface um, of, the, of the end plate has been scraped off in the static version. And if you look at the expandable hijack, all of the material on the surface is still there. And you almost get sort of a cleat-like uh, interference with the teeth that are pressing against the bony end plate with much less risk of, uh, of subsidence. So if I think about this sort of holistically, then you can think about, hey, you know what? I have to do a lot less grooming of my end plates to be able to get my cage to fit, right? Because I can just press the end plate nicely in there. I do less hammering and especially adjacent to levels where you have uh, potentially a problem that um, that patients also have myelopathy as well as that um, the distraction that you are normally required to get a hyperlordotic cage in there is not required at all because I just place my almost parallel end plates in there and then I just dial it up even up to 20 degrees of, uh, of lordosis and I'll show you uh, some of those examples. If we look at the monolithic loss, the significance of this is that throughout all of the studies that we've done so far, as well as what we've seen clinically in hybrid cases, the monolithic cages typically lose about 30% of the reconstructed lordosis and about 1.8 millimeters of height and that is the immediate scenario and this does not take into account that if you actually do some abrasive wear here on that surface and you have an osteoporotic patient that you might lose 90% of your lordosis because of the subsidence that you potentially induce here that would not occur at all when you press the end plates nicely against the bony end plates and leave all of the bony contact uh, intact. Um, we talked about the graft window already, and this is always an issue, right? Whether you look at, um, you know, anterior, posterior, lumbar type expandable cages. Um, I think the graft window is very admirable. It's certainly the same size as some of the, uh, the other cages you might be using. Um, I usually pre-pack it while the screwdriver is placed in here that allows for the expansion mechanism to work. And then the nice thing is there is a very um, 
a nifty way of being able to do a post fill after your expansion. And what I typically do is um, in the space where I have this central uh, graft window, I drill with my uh, three millimeter matchstick drill a small little divot or sometimes even a tiny little hole in the center. So I know that when I post fill, my bone graft that actually expands through this graft window, as you can see here on the right side also, and it goes sort of already into the space where my bone marrow uh, would, be, uh, would be bleeding from. There's multiple funnel options to accomplish this, and uh, it uh, allows for very easier and anterior access to that graft window. This is one of the examples. So this is one of the, uh, the device holders, and then through this space, you can actually place a, a funnel after you remove the screwdriver that allowed for the expansion of the device, and then place um, uh, place your bone graft to post fill this with good expansion of the bone graft towards the superior and inferior end plate. And it's not just a graft window that helps, right? We talked about sort of this cleat-like connection from the uh, end plates that allows some impression basically in the bony end plate of that uh, hijack uh, uh, super and infra end plate during the expansion. But the coding that's on there is not, uh, it's, it's not a, a coding per se, it's a, a subtractive process with a grid blasting and it has multiple um, uh, functions. There is initially um, uh, sort of a cleat-like connection because of the large serrations that are in there that allow almost sort of like a Velcro connection that I think some people may have just started liking when they start using 3D printed titanium, right? The surface is different than what we used to use with these solid peak cages. There was always some micro motion and these people never did as well immediately out of the gate until the fusion truly set in. I think titanium has proven to, um, to give that immediate stability a lot better because of this Velcro type adherence. So that's present here, as you can see depicted on the left side. And then the topography of the, um, the surface itself is, uh, um, has very good evidence based on the challenging dental environment, where this exact same uh, surface has been very instrumental in, uh, in allowing dental implants to reliably grow in. And it's a combination of macroscopic and microscopic pores. And you can see here at the bottom, there is um, both um, a combination of five to 10, as well as greater than 40 micron, uh, small divots and pits in there that allow bony uh, cells to lay down on the surface and eventually contribute to uh, creating stability and fusion. Um, if we look at um, the cage itself, initially what people might think, right, you have a, a relatively solid stable uh, core and then the end plates come away from it. Um, and this is um, uh, 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 was initially one of my concerns also, but then it actually shows that if you look at these um, these cages with the expandable end plates, that the final material and the final construct that you put in that disk space has a much more favorable um, uh, stiffness compared to all its titanium and peak competitors. This is actually a study from the FDA that was published by Peckerdal in 2017, and they took about 300 um, uh, cervical interbodies and tested the stiffness. So this is something different than the modulus of elasticity, right? Because the modulus of elasticity is a material property. So no matter whether you have a block of titanium or you have a, a very uh, nifty spring of titanium, the modulus of elasticity of the material doesn't change. What does change is the stiffness because the final construct you create purely depends on the stiffness of this spring versus the stiffness of the block of titanium. So stiffness is a, um, a structural property of the final implant you create and it has something uh, it's something very different than the modulus of elasticity, which is a material property. So if you look at all of the implants that uh, were compared here, the standard titanium interbody fusion devices are in the right column here, and their stiffness is about six times greater than, um, than bone. Peak is a little bit better because it's about half, but then if you look at the hijack, the final construct stiffness is um, in the fifth percentile compared to all of the other devices and it's very close to optimizing Wolf's law. So the body likes it, in addition to having much better end plate coverage without creating these serrations and abrasions on the end plate that reduce subsidence, the material itself that, that you put in there, the, the cage itself is so much less stiff that the likelihood it will subside is also much less despite still having much greater ability to produce sagittal correction and lifting up the anterior part of the spine. So all that together, um, initially when I looked at this, I said, you know, this makes a lot of sense to me compared to a lot of other gizmos that we get presented with, right? You have a large open graft window, you can dial in the, uh, the lordosis, the end plates themselves, they contribute to fusion 
based on the subtractive uh, surface with the grid blasting. And then the load sharing is, uh, is very appealing to me that the piece of material you put in there is not like a stiff block, but the modulus is actually, um, uh, apart from the titanium itself, um, used in this, in this scenario to create a much less stiff implant. And if we look so far at all the cases that have been done, and the company has more than 650 uh, cases over the past 18 months, you can see very reliable fusion with really no subsidence whatsoever. Um, so I'll stop there for a second before we talk about my clinical experience. If uh, if anybody has any questions, um, you want to jump in there, uh, Brett? Sure. Yeah. So just uh, I'll, while we wait for a few to uh, to ping up some questions in the chat room, I'll, I'll ask one, Dr. Polstra. You would noted the ability to dial in. And you may hit this a little bit in your clinical discussion, but the ability to dial in and stop at any amount of expansion. I'm curious in your own experience, does does muscle memory take over and you just drive this thing up till it clicks off or do you find yourself uh, dialing and stopping and what guides that decision? Yeah, it's a, it's a combination of things, Brad. Uh, the, um, um, uh, what I do better, and I think this sort of comes from uh, from the robotic experience, right? I feel that if you're better planned um, ahead with your case, you eventually have a better outcome. So I actually do a better job than I used to before, even with, say, a two-level ACDF now to look at the status of alignment of the patient. And I typically say if we do like a four-level, right? We start at the top, so I start at the four and then work my way down. And um, depending on where the patient is lacking lordosis, which is usually the lower part, I sometimes at the upper levels, um, I become a little bit less aggressive. There is mm -hmm. a torque limiting driver, and especially if there are some osteophytes and 3-4 is kind of stuck down already, then um, based on planning, as well as the intraoperative gauging of how much I need to do, um, I sometimes expand it maybe three quarters of the way, and then I stop because what I don't want is that I potentially create hyperlordosis at the upper part of the cervical spine, especially in little old ladies, because they're swallowing. And so, you know, when you go to two, three and three, four, their swallowing is sometimes an issue already from the approach. So I think over, over distracting people in the upper cervical spine is, uh, is counterproductive, usually at the, the lower levels, also because the, um, the footprint I can use is usually a little bit larger. So there's a little bit more surface pressure that can get divided through the larger implant. I, mm -hmm. I usually try to get as much out of it as possible. So uh, it's a little bit of, um, uh, I guess, a clinical feel during surgery and it's, uh, and it's planning. And then in combination, people will see, I think, that at the top, you might not be as aggressive. And at the lower part, you take an implant that has a little bit more expandability into lordosis. And typically, uh, I, uh, I like to get to the torque limiting end of the, of the insertion driver. Okay, great. Uh, we've had a couple other that have been um, stuck in here. So uh, let's see, there's a question here about what are you using for bone graft to be able to post fill through the implant? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. If you are um, uh, meticulous about um, uh, filing down or, or shaving down your autograft, I like to keep as much as I can, right? Then uh, you can certainly use that. Um, when I use my three millimeter matchstick to uh, to take off some of the anterior or the posterior osteophytes especially. And I know there is no disc material in that. I actually take a little Penfield 4 and I harvest all those shavings and we call it sort of nectar of life. Um, and uh, and I usually like to mix that in with whatever else I have. I have been um, very fond of a product called uh, Magnetos. It is made by a company called Curos, K-U-R-O-S. Um, primarily, again, because the clinical data is so good of that product, um, I got no additional conflicts or anything. But it's been it's been working really well in my in my cases, and I actually like to place that through the funnel because it's sort of a gritty type material, and uh, along with the um, uh, the nectar of life that I mix in there together it fits beautifully down the funnel with any kind of you know additional small pieces of local autograft so that has uh, that's been my workhorse and uh, as you saw in the picture I can get that really pressurized sort of in there and for the orthopedist I mean we know about impaction grafting right if we have a good approximation of your bone graft to the patient's native bone the likelihood you have good incorporation is high so that in combination has worked really well perfect um, there's one technical question about the implant that maybe I'll, I'll take and have you chime in, Dr. Pulser. There's a question uh, from Tim Graves about the locking mechanism. So importantly, with hijack, there is no secondary step. So, you know, with one instrument, Dr. Pulser, it places the implant in, dials it up, and then stops and releases the inserter. So how do we ensure that we don't lose that distraction? There's sort of two redundant features that are built in. The first is the mechanism itself is such that as the end plates of the implant are loaded, 
uh, the drive screw is being pulled in tension, which is the same effect as a bolt being tightened in your in your car or what have you. So once that bolt is tightened, it does not want to walk. So that sort of finger trap type mechanism is step one or part one. Part two is there is an interference fit that has been designed into the screw. So while the surgeon can easily overcome that drag feature with the torque limiting handle that's provided to them, that drag feature has been put in there to mitigate any sort of concern of vibrational uh, walking of the screw. And so that allows the surgeon to dial up and stop at any point along the way. Um, okay, we've got a couple more here, but you know what? I think Dr. Polsha, why don't these are good? Keep the questions coming, please. Maybe we'll let Dr. Polsha get into the clinical uh, on this and then we can hit uh, the rest of these questions at the end of the clinical part of hijack, and then we're going to transition into V3 and to standalone. But please keep okay. the question. Perfect. Very good. Yeah. So um, if you um, if you see my uh, my PowerPoint again, this is um, uh, the expansion, I guess, of the NAS talk that uh, that we gave the initial case series. And I want to acknowledge my co-authors here from uh, both Destin, Jupiter, and then from me now here in Los Gatos. Uh, about the uh, initial 25 cases we've done um, uh, with uh, the expandable hijack, um, and and as we alluded to earlier, right? I mean, the things that we see sometimes is that uh, we do not reconstruct well enough in the cervical spine because it just has simply um, has um, has not had as much attention is the, the lack of good sagittal balance after the reconstruction. And it actually shows, if you look at the literature, if you leave these people, for people forward, they still have to then uh, put a significant amount of traction on their posterior cervical uh, musculature. And that then uh, uh, leads to accelerated adjacent segment degeneration. So it's not just fusion. There is more to the story when we do these reconstructions. Um, I think that all of us have seen that, hey, you know what, if you go anterior only, fusion rates drop from uh, the, the anticipated 90 plus percent to maybe the 60 to 80 percent range because not everything fuses. And that might actually have to do with the fact that we leave these people forward so they're biomechanically not loading that implant interface well enough to be able to get the bone graft to be nice and stable and eventually fuse because there is too much dynamic instability still because the head is leaning forward and this continuous muscle force that's required actually causes perpetual micro motion so the fusion cannot uh, cannot set up and then if you look at the subsidence rates and sort of the loss of our reconstruction is pretty significant um, and initially doing a good reconstruction and what I used to use was um, structural allograft right I think most of us grew up with like VG2 allograft because it was really nothing else 20 years ago so um, unfortunately sometimes you had a block of bone that simply just resorbed and you had no idea why uh, but then these patients uh, did not just have maybe some Subsidence initially due to what you did during the surgery, but also the block of bone went away and then the plate, God forbid it was a translational plate, you got complete collapse anteriorly, and then it puts the patient out of balance again, again, uh, with all the other issues above that we talked about that are disadvantageous. Um, and then the question is, hey, you know what, if this happens, why should we do the anterior and then not the posterior case? Well, um, I guess if you do a good job and you get a good sagittal reconstruction and you get your fusions, even in the multi-level cases up to like 90% or so, I don't want to over operate on 90% of my patients. I know it is, uh, you know, financially maybe attractive to do an anterior or posterior, especially if you stage them and so on. I would say, you know what, that is over operating on 80 to 90% of your patient population. And if you have a good discussion with your patient and say, you know what, you have a four level, we like to do an anterior operation because posteriorly, especially these people with like sort of these humps and um, maybe not uh, the most desirable uh, pulmonary profile, putting them prone and doing these cases from the back in addition to the front is, I think, uh, counterproductive. The comorbidity is much greater. People have higher rates of blood loss and uh, wound healing complications afterwards. They're in the hospital longer and so on. So I, I think that if you can stay anterior, it's beneficial for, uh, for all of us. But we may need to have, um, you know, a better solution than what is currently being offered with the um, uh, anterior cervical standalone uh, uh, or static cages. Um, so the initial case series that we did with this uh, were uh, 25 patients, half and half uh, male, female. 50% of these cases were revisions. It was a total of 65 levels. And typically, like in my practice, 50% are three or four level cases. Um, and usually uh, these revision ones uh, become more levels. Um, so you see the breakdown here. This was a, a near Medicare population, right? Some younger, some older patients, but on average about 65. And they had the standard comorbidities, right? I can't change the world and, and 
you know, people still come in with diabetes and they're smoking and they're having bad diets and so on. So we take all comers and take take good care of the community. So this is, uh, I think, a real life sort of series similar to what hopefully all of you are doing. And at the time of uh, initial presentation, we had about seven and a half month average follow up. Everybody's now more than a year out and, um, and, and the data actually stands exactly the way it is right now. Of these 25 uh, initial patients, seven cases were hybrids because I was still utilizing um, uh, and, and still do an occasion here, the, the static cage, as you can see at the top here, that's a 3D printed cage. And then at the bottom, I felt, hey, I need more lordosis than what I can get out of a static cage and I don't want to abrade the end plate. And there's, uh, as you can see, an example of two uh, hijack ACs below the, um, the uh, static cage. Um, the lordotic correction was uh, was very carefully measured independently, and what we found initially already, especially looking at these hybrid cases versus the um, um, uh, where the uh, static cage was used versus the hijack AC, is that there was much better um, correction of the lordosis with the, um, the uh, hijack. Uh, we went up to 8.6 uh, degrees versus only 5.7 degrees in the static cages, although the lordosis of the cage was the same. But this goes back to sort of the abrasive nature and potentially the stiffness of the implant. And uh, this was a significant difference already. And the good news was that in these cages that we had um, this nice reconstruction of almost nine degrees of lordosis per level, over the first two months, there was no loss of more than like 0 0.6 degrees per level. So pretty much negligible. Um, and uh, I think many of us have seen uh, a little bit more lordosis loss when you really critically look at your films at like three months, you go like, you know what, I wish I got a little bit more lordosis out of it because um, my poor patient is leaning forward already despite what I did in the operating room. So that does not happen with this. And I think it is partially due to the fact that we had absolute minimal subsidence despite a higher correction angle. And I think this goes due to the, um, the technicalities of how you reconstruct that angle that you don't just abrade it in there with a hyperlordotic cage. You place your cage and then just simply um, during the expansion press the end plate with this Velcro connection into the uh, to bony end plate or onto the bony end plate and elevate the level. Um, if we look at um, the fusion status, um, 25 of 28 levels that had FlexX at three months already were fused. Both um, uh, these um, uh, these cases, whether they were short or long, had excellent meaningful clinical improvement in NDI and VAS, and we had zero revisions in these uh, in these cases. And up to uh, what I said, uh, more than a year out, that still um, uh, holds true. Uh, more than 650 levels have been done, and per Atlas, there have been no single revisions um, that they know of of the um, uh, of the hijack AC levels. And I want to just just illustrate this with uh, with a standard case. I think we all see this, right? It's a, it's a mid 70s year old gentleman, otherwise you know pretty healthy, but uh, he's been a smoker. He's um, had uh, some difficulties with his balance. His hands are certainly clumsy on exam. He has Clones and Hoffman's. He has an MRI scan that we all know, right? These people get stiff in the lower cervical levels, and then they develop this sort of compensatory hypermobility, what I always call it, at C4, C5, and um, the progressive DG generation then occurs above and this man has a lot of neck pain for the past eight years he's had multiple injections to be able to try to ameliorate this because he's just out of balance as soon as he is uh, he is upright and he can't really look straight ahead anymore because of the way that he's now leaning forward and because of his myelopathy he had some falls and um and and you know he's in in need of an operation and you know i know there's 10 different things you can do but in this case i decided to do a c3 to c7 um, ACDF try to stay uh, anterior on him only with these hijack cages and actually we did some fluoro images that I pulled off the system after uh, afterwards and you can clearly see that uh, the uh, expansion here uh, that we were able to achieve with the hijack allowed for very simple placement uh, of the uh, of the implant and then press the end plates of the implant nicely up against the uh, bony end plates and if you see the expansion mechanism here it allows not just for anterior height and lordosis reconstruction but also this posterior opening to give a little bit more breathing room and consistently when we measured this right on these magnified images it was um, slightly over a millimeter at each level and I think this is something that we all like we like stability around the nerve because that helps these people to feel right away better with their shoulder and arm pain and their weakness as well as that um, um, I think a little bit of additional breathing room for the nerve is very appealing. So um, this guy had excellent neurologic recovery. His uh, his neck pain immediately improved as soon as he was out of surgery. Um, and uh, I think with having a reliable persistent 
correction like this, even despite the fact that, you know, the collar comes off and so on. And these people's GPS are not normal, right? Their, their homing mechanism is forward. They've been carrying their head in that forward position, as you can see on the left side, for a long time. And um, being able to tell the patient, hey, you know what, we reconstruct you and we can keep you in that position is, um, is I think, very beneficial. And I think it's due to the implant design and the, the lesser stiffness of that interbody construct. Uh, you can see here that he came in with 16 degrees of kyphosis and eventually we got him almost to 24 degrees of lordosis and he's actually when you do his measurements here with uh, the cervical SVA and so on is, uh, is is in perfect position so I think it helps now to plan this beforehand and then most importantly have an implant that can deliver during the case without losing that post-operatively. So what Hijack AC did for me is that, you know, we talked about this, uh, this sagittal imbalance in the cervical spine that was an issue before. Um, I think being able to dial in where you need to, especially the lower cervical levels, makes it very appealing to get these people uh, nicely upright and keep them there. I think the fusion rate for, uh, for what I have seen so far, based on the end plate texture that's on there due to the grid blasting, um, uh, helps to incorporate this with the fusion in addition to this graft twin that we can pack and again have better load sharing because you do a better reconstruction and have a well-balanced spine contributes to getting things nicely to fuse I think subsidence rates, like we talked about, from having to hammer these cages in there with uh, with relatively aggressive surfaces, makes uh, makes not a lot of sense. If you can do it very smoothly with this, you just deliver the end plate without any tapping sometimes, and then you just place that implant nicely between uh, between the bony end plates while you expand it and press the end plate on there, and it's much less uh, impactful, especially adjacent levels with myelopathy don't suffer from this, and much less end plate grooming is necessary. Um, and because of that. I think I've been staying much more anterior only with this and uh, get my correction from the front and, and feel reliable and comfortable that I can keep it there. So I think there is, um, as opposed to what some people might think, I think there is a place for expandable cervicals um, and, and hopefully the data over time will um, uh, will show that this is um, you know a wonderful solution in your uh, toolbox of, um, of, of tricks to be able to get these people upright. And I would love to, um, to get your experience and, and, and get your hands on it and uh, maybe share that um, with the company how you feel about this. Let me pause there for uh, for a second. Uh, as I saw, there were a bunch of questions that came up. Um, yeah, great, thank you. And uh, if anyone has questions they want to ask uh, via the microphone, feel free to unmute. Uh, and Dr. Polster will start. Uh, I'll play MC here and give you some of the questions that have shown up. Um, let's see, uh, Chris Matson. Hopefully, the volume is looking better for you. Um, let's see, uh, would Tom ask about um, your your Caspar pinless method and whether you feel that this device complements uh, not using the Caspar pins? And uh, and I guess my own addition to that, why do you think um, you you seem to be uh, in the rare case of a surgeon who does not use Caspar pins? Why do you think other surgeons are less inclined and in, in how this device complements as Tom had asked. Uh, yeah, so that's interesting. I, I always say, you know what, we we sort of, you know, we perform our surgeries um, uh, based on uh, not so much evidence, but usually eminence, right? You were trained a certain way. So, you know, in your training, if they put in Kespar pins and they put a retractor in, I mean, that's how you set up your cage. You put your shadow line retractor in and that's how you get going. Um, I... Um, uh, never liked drilling holes in the vertebral body uh, unless you absolutely had to, right? So even when I do my uh, my cervical disc arthroplasties, I don't use Caspar pins. I use a little distracting device. Um, I think it's much less traumatic and it actually allows the spine, once you take that um, a little laminar spreader out, it allows the spine to go back where it wants to be. And to me, actually, that helps to pick the right size and to dial in eventually what I want, as opposed to sometimes with these pins, as we all know, right, you might cause a little anterior posterior translation depending on the amount of force you have to put on the construct to be able to get that distraction so I think allowing the spine to be as much natural in its normal position as possible with just a little bump under the shoulder and then having a dynamic amount of distraction that you can apply with that laminar spreader quickly in and out um, makes the case go a little quicker for me 
I don't like to use um, to drill additional holes, especially if you don't have to put a little plate on there, and sometimes it interferes with where the hole was already. Um, so, so for all those reasons, I uh, I think that the agility and the speed by which we do these cases now is uh, is sort of countered by these Caspar pins. So, um, I don't need it for the distraction and visualization and discectomy, and I think it is uh, it is not necessary to drill additional holes. So, based on uh, based on that, I I simply have never uh, have never used it when I was done with my training. Perfect. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, we got a question here from Vicky. How deep do you choose to place the cage and is that different with the hijack technology versus static cages you've used previously? Um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I do um, I do like uh, to be able to have, you know, say that this atraumatic placement of the cage, right? As anybody knows, you know, when you have to get sometimes a hyperlordotic cage in there and it's kind of stiff and tight already, and you have to sort of hammer it in there, but with every every tap, it might go a little bit further. It might not really go. You have to hammer it kind of hard and it's, it's uh, you know, somewhat unpredictable sometimes. What I do like a lot is that what I said, right, I drilled this little hole in the inferior and superior end plate to allow a little bit of bleeding bone potentially go into that graft chamber and as I said I use sort of this magnetose material that expands nicely into the um, uh, inferior and superior divot that I drill and then the nice thing is that where I drill that hole I can actually deliver the implant sometimes without tapping at all I just place it in there hold my uh, my device holder and then simply expand it so then the end plates when they have sort of this cleat like this velcro connection with the bony end plates it keeps the implant exactly where it wants to to be and I, I think I'm putting the cages a little bit deeper since I'm comfortable delivering it exactly where I want it to be without it sort of sticking out the back and certainly not hitting like against an osteophyte that then potentially might break off towards the spinal canal. So, so I think it is a little bit more uh, subtle, it's a little bit more predictable to place this compared to having sort of an abrasive static cage in there. Perfect. Okay, uh, we're going to hit a few more questions. For those who join late, just a reminder, we're in the Q&A on hijack, but we are going to discuss V3 and the standalone, which are shorter sections, but please, you know, hang on through the Q&As here. Um, let's see, the next question we have is uh, about trialing and sort of your initial starting height. Uh, admittedly, Atlas has, has added a variable here that didn't used to exist. You used to trial to the final height of what you put in. How do you handle, and I, I can tell you that this is a... Um, a topic of discussion with many of the surgeons who use it. What is your philosophy and method when it comes to trialing with this system? Um, yeah, so the trialing is, is merely for size, I think, you know, whether you put a, a 13 by 15 or 15 by 17 in there. And then uh, it's uh, it's based on the gauge that I think with this laminar spreader, I have an idea already how much I can get out of it from a low dose and distraction standpoint. And it is based on my pre-planning. So it's a combination of those factors where um, where I typically pick uh, pick my cage. You guys start off with, uh, you know, something like, like say an eight, which is sort of your workhorse. And once you start working with this, you very quickly, right like all of us we look into the space and we go like oh you know i know that's going to be an eight right i know it's going to fit i know it's not you know so so um it uh, it is a combination of things initially where you want to be a little bit careful with the trials and see where you are and then it is uh, it is the distractibility of that cage uh, of that um, of that space um, as well as your experience based on the size that is there and how much force it took with uh, either Caspar pins or in my case, this little laminar spreader of how much um, uh, it took to get the space opened up to what I dialed in initially in my planning phase what that level would need um, so i don't have like a perfect answer for it like this is like the workflow of how to do it um, and uh, and i think everybody is is in his own right uh capable of having done these cases a lot to, to gauge what would be in there uh, but i would encourage you to use the trials and use sort of your sense of distractibility with the planning to come to the final answer of which uh, which size implant you would pick perfect and just one comment to add there, uh, while not standard in this system, Atlas does have available expandable trials. Uh, we found that for early users or even surgeons that are, are not yet, um, maybe they don't even have hospital approval yet, or they're not yet convinced of the value of the technology, these expandable trials are a one-to-one -one replica of the implants that just don't have teeth. And it yeah. provides the opportunity to get that beautiful image that Dr. Polster showed where you see you know, slide the cage in, you've got X amount of lordose it, flip it to the other side of the screen, expand it up, and then you see that change. Uh, we found that once the surgeons get comfortable with the system, they don't tend to use the expandable trials. It's just a, a step that they don't need because they, they tend to have a sense of what they want. 
but it is available for you know both the sales uh, strategy and and for surgeons who might have an interest. Yeah, I didn't want to want to talk about it because I'm not sure if it was available for everybody initially. Maybe it might be a good idea to have it in the initial sets, right? To give yeah. people an idea of where they can uh, where they can get to with this implant. Um, but as you said, yeah, after a couple of cases, you go like, oh, you know, I I know what I need to use now. It's just a familiarity with the system that that comes pretty quick. Yeah, we we've, we've been, it's er, early training wheels. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, let's see, Dave had a question here. At the C3-4 uh, or at the upper levels, when using a static cage, are you using a parallel or zero degree, or do you still use a lordotic implant at that level? Yeah, I um, I still use a, a lordotic implant at that level, and I think that's where the beauty comes in, that this is like a continuous um, uh, distraction anteriorly, right? A continuous dialing of lordosis with this implant, but you can stop wherever you want to. So initially, if you pick a parallel implant that goes zero to seven degrees, you can say, you know what, I put it in there, but I really don't want to do any, any distraction here. So you dial it up just so the end plates have good contact with the bony end plates, and you post fill it so you have nice uh, filling and expansion sort of of the uh, of the bone graft towards the end plates and then that's it right so you can use it perfectly for that but i typically still use a a lordotic uh, implant even if it's a uh, if it's a static cage that um um that i used before uh prior to hijack but now with hijack i think it's uh, it's tremendously beneficial to um uh to be able to dial in exactly the lordosis you want or say hey you know what i'm happy with the parallel here and uh, and i'm not going to expand it any further Perfect. And then one last one here from uh, Joseph, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll handle one part of this and then hand it to you, Dr. Polster. Have there been any uh, incidents for a scrub tech or a rep to look out for intraoperatively during the surgery? The, the only thing I'm aware of is there is a, uh, a step that the scrub tech has to be careful about. You do have to pre-pack around the driver, which means the screwdriver, and this is getting into the nitty gritty, but you need the screwdriver engaged into the implant first. If you it's intuitive normally for the scrub tech they get the inner body and they start packing it if they do that the driver won't engage and then you won't be able to get expansion you'll figure that out very quickly that's the only experience we've seen intraoperatively occurred at dr polstra what have you had you know on your back table go go wrong if you will um, well, that's exactly it. I mean, the first two times uh, they were like, well, you know, we got this good bone graft, so we've got to put this in there and they stuffed it full of magnetos. And then, you know, we, of course, we couldn't get the driver down because the expansion mechanism is, uh, you know, sort of to the posterior one third of the uh, of the of the cage. Um, that's the only thing, really. I think the holder fits very nicely. It's a very, very sort of um, a smooth anterior surface with these very superficial um, uh, cutouts. But the holder is actually beautifully designed and it gives you great stability. So it's uh, it's never been an issue to get that on um, and, uh, and there's really nothing special I think that needs to be done other than that, that screwdriver needs to be in there and then what they can help with already is start to pack the funnel because I think the post packing feature that, uh, that that you have with this is, is instrumental in getting a solid fusion through that graft chamber so they can start packing that funnel and that uh, that sometimes takes a little practice uh, which depending on the material that you want to use. Absolutely great. Okay, well, why don't we switch uh, our transition on to V3 and um, everybody continue to shoot questions over. We can certainly continue to discuss hijack at the at the next break point if there are other questions that arise. Okay, very good. Um, I know we have uh, maybe about 10 minutes or so left, so we go uh, we go pretty quick through this. Um, this is, uh, as I said earlier, right, a segmental plating system. Some of you might be familiar with this. I, uh, I have liked segmental plating from various companies for a long time because I think it reduces the relative stiffness of the entire construct, right? We've mentioned this numerous times today. I think it, it helps with the incorporation, it reduces subsidence, and it gives people a little bit of a less sense of like a true stiff, stiff neck after this. Um, so the V3 plating system, as you can see, is a triangular um, uh, plating system with a, uh, a manhole cover in the front. Um, there are cell threading screws. I mean, there's multiple sizes. It's very intuitive. And then the nice thing is this actually can be guided right down to your um, uh, hijack AC implant. So you see the, uh, the implant in there. And then there's like a guide uh, alignment pin, if you will, that comes through the, uh, through the plate that fits right into the hole. And actually, the nice thing is that we talked about sort of this impaction grafting, right? So what this pin allows um, uh, also is that once you stick this into the um, implant, it actually allows for some additional post pressure, if you will, onto the, the in my case, this magnetos uh, mixed with, with whatever autologous type bone that I have from there. 
um, to be able to pressurize a little bit so you get additional graft that uh, graft material that gets against the bony end plate so um, gets placed in there I like to plate short right so I could have gone even shorter here as you can see at the bottom but I like to plate short to stay away especially from the adjacent segment not to cause any additional degeneration there and uh, the plates can be placed um, with uh, the triangle up or the triangle down as you can see here in this four level where uh, the plates actually have the small hole at the top and not at the bottom and uh, they fit very nicely together so imagine if you had to do a revision uh, because you played nice and short with this there is very little additional metal that goes above and below the, the screw holes so it'd be very easy to add something onto it and I think what we sometimes see is that you know you have these tremendous osteophytes and this, this sort of contributing to the stiffness of the end plate of the patient that you don't want to bite away well then this implant actually allows you to be maybe slightly placed at an angle position so you put one hole in the place next to a tremendous osteophyte if you want to leave that sitting there anterior to the uh, to the to the disc space and um uh, then you place your two holes at the at the opposite side so um i think the ease of having a guided plate optimizes uh, your ability to have perfect plate length especially for multi-level constructs and not getting into the adjacent area and then uh, the, the segmental plating i think allows for the entire construct of three or four levels to be slightly less stiff than what you would have with a, a normal plate and there's also the ease of being able to you know what you do three three four and four five and then you drop down to five six and six seven you're done with those top two levels because sometimes it's so frustrating that you put four cages in and you have to try to fit a four hole plate on the or a four level plate um, consisting of like five different holes and they all have to fit exactly and you can't get really the top hole to fit right adjacent to say the inferior surface of c2 or c3 mm -hmm. the bottom doesn't really fit onto c7 it's a little long and it's kind of hard to make those middle holes fit because the anatomy isn't exactly perfect having to put a full plate on there also means you have to take all the osteophytes down and sometimes there's a lot of additional soft tissue distraction here with a handheld to be able to get back to C2, C3 or C3, C4 if you've eventually started working at the bottom. So now it is nice that you place your hijack AC, you slide quickly over this guide pin, your V3 plate on there and you're done and you just move on to the distal levels and once you've done C7 or C7, T1 even, I mean you're done. You don't have to worry about the levels above and I think people that have done some segmental plating definitely uh, understand this and uh, and have loved that about uh, about this type of construct. So I think that's uh, that's tremendously helpful and if we look at you know having sort of these standalone segmental type fixations right what is best without belaboring this this is actually data from Zimmer Biomed when they compared a lot of different constructs this is uh, the motion of a intact segment on the left here with the black bar and then you have the red bar here with just a zero profile type device with the screws coming out of the uh, anterior part of the interdiscal device the amount of motion is still almost like 70 percent whereas if you put a plate on there you can see you have significant reduction here to the 30 40 percent range so uh, so it's definitely better with uh, with uh, the stability of the plate as opposed to having screws in the disc space um, I think another benefit is that having a plate on there prevents you from having any of the skiving of the uh, of the screw almost parallel to the end plate right we've all seen this at c667 or 71 that you put your screw in there in sort of this standalone device and that top screw basically skives on the inter inferior surface of the c6 or c7 end plate and you can't really angle that screw reliably upward to get good fixation and especially at the bottom of the cervical spine i think it uh, it reduces your ability to get a stable construct um so it fiddles much less than having these you know different screw angles and I think for some people having an additional plate with the 22845 or 22846 codes is, is appealing I mean that should not necessarily be your primary reason but of course it's something to uh, to consider if you look at the transitional um, uh, of the transition of people into this, this is uh, presented by uh, by Heinz of 227 retrospective le retrospective levels with segmental plating. As uh, as you can see here, um, they had a 92% fusion rate even in the three or four levels uh, based on uh, CT bone bridging and uh, less than two millimeters of flexion extension. And you can see the breakdown here on the left side. But again, the uh, the data was really appealing for uh, even segmental plating. So I'll stop there based on V3 since uh, we have a couple minutes left and I certainly want to get to a hijack standalone also. Thank you. So one question that came in direct to me, Dr. Pulser, back on hijack, but I think it's important to discuss. Uh, you know, there's a visual beauty of seeing these three and four level reconstructions and what hijack is able to do. 
uh, and complementing your, your techniques. Uh, what are your thoughts to, to your community surgeon that may, you know, uh, traditionally have one, uh, maybe up to two level procedures where he's doing most of his, uh, his bread and butter cases? Do you still use hijack for those cases? And do you think the value proposition is as great for the simple cases as it is for the complex? Um, yeah, I think very much so, because what I would say is that sometimes we think about these simple cases too simple, right? There's a lot of people that do single and two-level T-lefts all day long, and they actually inadvertently put the patient in kyphosis. I mean, this is well borne out, right? That a lot of, a lot of um, uh, you know, we're all guilty of this sometimes, right? Um, are, are not paying attention too much to, uh, to alignment. So I think there's a lot of people that uh, potentially at these two-level ACDFs that they might be doing inadvertently uh, try to put a lordotic cage in there but the spine doesn't really conform to it because of um, maybe not proper technique or simply abrading the end plane. And then anteriorly, although the cage is tall in the front, there is so much abrasion that you simply lose all of that benefit of that lordosis. Um, so I think if people become more in tune that, hey, you know what, your global balance includes, yeah, your neck also, especially if you do five, six, six, seven very common levels in the community, right? Dialing that patient up out of their thoracic spine a little bit more will help you get reduction of adjacent segment issues, greater chance for fusion since you are not dynamically teeter-tottering back and forth. You have your spine perfectly corrected the way that the head needs to be carried over the shoulder. So I think we don't want to have, uh, have, have surgeons cause iatrogenic deformity by locking these people inadvertently into kyphosis due to all of these sort of drawbacks that static cages potentially come with. So even for the single and two level uh, cases, I think it is, uh, it is a wonderful way to allow people to What's up, man? And yeah, it's still they, on there, but they're once they're able to uh, to see the benefit of it, I think it is um, um, it is going to um, uh, to make them like the implant even more by maintaining that lordotic correction. Perfect. Okay, um, we'll we'll move on to standalone. Just one other comment on V3 as you pull that up, Dr. Pulcher. V3, uh, while as hijack, we've got 18 months of experience. V3 is sort of in its alpha, so we launched that early this year. Uh, slightly pre-COVID, so the, those sets are out there, and you know certainly we expect to expand upon the, the clinical research on V3 as as the system evolves. Yeah. Perfect. Very good. So I'll move on uh, with this. We have like five minutes left, I think. So this is uh, sort of the combination of uh, number one and two together uh, without having the drawback of having fixation that comes out of the disc space itself, right? This is an anterior plate basically set onto the uh, the, the hijack anterior cervical. Um, I think uh, what we learned already is that, uh, you know, this is basically the same implant with identical footprints, height and expansion range with the lordotic angles like we talked about already. So it's a very intuitive way you do your normal uh, decompression and then without having any distraction on there you basically just drop this in there very smooth without any additional hammering you expand it you have a little drill guide or an awl you put your screws in you lock it together and then you post pack it again and I think that's very appealing with this um, utilizing one instrument in in this case the funnel I think with the 650 plus cases that have been done there's good um, um, uh, good data now that this works and uh, hopefully late some um, uh, COVID willing, uh, we'll be able to uh, to get this in our hands, and and I hope the company can really introduce it at that point. And I want to bring this graph back where you know we talked about an intact spine here on the left hand side, and then what these sort of standalone devices will do. As you can see here, the the plating system that's attached to the cage here has certainly the best biomechanical stability after the screws are placed. And um, I think that um, you guys understand at this point that you know dialing in the patient correctly and then just dropping these two screws attached to the implant would make this uh, a very little fiddle factor type uh, type thing with the uh, predetermined uh, straightforward screw angles that you don't have to struggle with in the intervertebral disc space, but it goes straight on the anterior cervical spine. It's very thin, the anterior plate. So I think that is uh, that is going to be altogether very appealing, and I can't wait to uh, to get it out there and um, and and put um, you know multiple of these levels together and see how they work. Awesome. And uh, guys, we can certainly stick around for questions. So while we know we're up against the 11 o'clock, don't don't hesitate to ask some questions uh, and make sure we get everything addressed. I, I'll ask one, Dr. Bolster, which I know we've discussed offline. Atlas is sort of developing this uh, this menu of of cervical options. You've got hijack and V3, which is you know an option for you. You've got hijack and, and traditional plating, which is an option. 
and now coming soon, you'll have the standalone. What, where do you see the clinical application in your own practice for when a standalone would be appropriate uh, versus uh, the V3 and hijacked uh, philosophy? Yeah, um, I mean, of course, it depends a little bit on the clinical experience we're going to get with this, right? I mean, I'll, I'll say that up front. But what I would think is that um, I like these, uh, these standalone devices when you have a nice, flat, smooth anterior longitudinal ligament without any additional uh, osteophytes and so on. I think it would fit perfectly for that. Uh, what we sometimes see is that there is, you know, people that build these osteophytes that are sometimes even larger than the vertebral body itself, right? Then I would be kind of hesitant because I would potentially place my interbody device deeper than what this end plate would allow me to do, right? I would be able to independently place my implant, dial it up, and then put a plate on there, and especially with V3, maybe avoid some of these nasty osteophytes that sit there. So that would be my choice for those patients. But if you have a, a relatively standard, straightforward case where people at 6, 7, 5, 6 could use a little bit of extra lordosis, I think the standalone device makes perfect sense. The simplicity of it is very appealing to me, and um, and, and I can't wait, you know, and see what the, what the clinical experience is going to be, because because I can't speak to that, of course, at this point, but intuitively it makes a lot of sense. The biomechanics are supported by it. The cage is not hyper stiff, but the stability of the construct is really good based on data that we know and I just shared with you. So all, all together, intuitively, it makes a lot of sense. And, um, and, and I hope when, when we get our hands on it, clinically the experience is only going to complement that. Perfect, likewise. Okay, we've had a couple other questions come in. David had asked, uh, do you believe that a regular cervical plate, I'm assuming he means non-segmental plating, does that help to restore any of the lordosis or is it uh, there primarily just to stabilize? Yeah, that's a great question. I always um, felt, David, that that I needed to use a um, a lordotic plate that was slightly more lordotic than what the spine was positioned as on the on the table, right? So then you uh, you fitted, say, your bottom screws or your top screws, and then you pulled your spine almost like towards the plates to aid into lordosis because the interbodies simply weren't good enough. But then, you know, looking at these cases afterwards, what I always felt is that because of pulling the spine up. I actually caused a little distraction, especially at the middle two levels, against my um, my interbody graft. And sometimes I put a pen field forth with a little opening in the plate. Say, you know, I used what I said, right, the VG2 allograft. So initially it fitted nicely, but then I brought the spine more up into lordosis, and I could almost like wiggle that graft in there, and I had to sort of hammer it back in there to sort of fit it. Um, in there. So I think the plate should merely be sort of your stabilizing tension bands, but your workhorse is your interbody device. It is very much analogous to when we do uh -huh. these um, adult deformity corrections now with, say, a 3-4 level lateral or 1-2 level a lift below or o lift or whatever you want to use. That's how you dial in your spine. And then you flip your patient and you just put a posterior tension band in with minimally invasive hardware. That hardware is not going to do your reconstruction anymore. You're not going to bend those rods in an MIS fashion. I think the cervical spine is slowly evolving to that same scenario, but I would very much caution you to using a, um, a hyperlordotic sort of plate compared to what your spine looks like after the antibodies because the conformity against those, those end plates and the incorporation of your bone graft is simply not going to be as good as, uh, as it could be. So I always place a slightly um, inflated arterial line back underneath the shoulders of my patient. So I sometimes can vary that even simple during surgery by a little bit of additional inflation. And then I use the implants now to get nice end plate to end plate coverage and pressure, and then just drop my plate in there without having to do anything different. And I think biomechanically, the risk then of loosening and, and relying on things that potentially uh, could make your construct fail is is much less by just having good antibody support. So um, that 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 would be my best advice on that. Perfect. Okay, we got two more here. One that I can quickly address. Uh, Joseph had asked, is the construct assembled on the back table? Um, if you're referencing standalone, the answer is no. That's all one unit. So it is one physical piece of metal that you insert, expand, drop your two screws in. Uh, and then hijack in V3, that option you would place hijack first, do your procedure, expand it, post pack, and then the, the guided plate holder comes in separate. So it is a distinct plate and cage. This is not one of these gray areas of, oh, well, I'm technically expanding it intraoperatively or, I'm, or excuse me, 
I'm technically assembling on the back table or I'm assembling interoperatively. The plate and the cage and V3 and hijack are completely distinct. Um, and then uh, one other question that got sent in is uh, the perception of uh, dysphagia. Dysphagia, uh, you know, is a short segmental plating um, as, uh, you know, as complementary to, to minimizing dysphagia as is a zero profile. Your thoughts and your clinical experience with that. Yeah. Um, so, so as I said earlier, right, sometimes, you know, in these people that are fairly uh, kyphotic before and you make them really lordotic, it is sometimes a bear to get back to that C3-4 or even worse, like 2-3 level, right, to put your screws because your incision is basically staying in the same place, but you start to sort of sequentially push the spine away and upward as you work from the top to the bottom. At least that's sort of what my sequence is. So I think having much less of sort of, you know, handheld retraction and so on to be able to put those screws in at the top levels. Uh, by just finishing every level, put a little V3 plate on there and move on with your segmental plating is, I think, tremendously beneficial. And then the other thing is that, um, you know, dysphagia has been like, uh, you know, sort of the um, uh, the black sheep, if you will, of all of these studies, right? Everybody touts that, you know what, with disc arthroplasty, you have it less because you don't lean with your screwdriver towards the esophagus. With certain retractors, you have it less. With dynamic retraction, you have it less. Um, I think speed of surgery makes a huge difference. If you take three, four levels um, and you do like an eight hour case, yeah, nobody can swallow afterwards, right? It's clear that in the upper cervical spine, the risk is greater, so less soft tissue retraction, mm -hmm. being quick, facile, and be done done with it quickly is, is tremendously beneficial, I think. But if you look at the V3 plating system or the, um, the, the standalone once it comes out, um, what you can imagine is that actually placing divergent screws um, improves your fixation. There's good data to show that diverging screws improve the pullout strength, so that's one thing. So you don't have to lean very hard onto the esophagus because you just come from the opposite side and you place your screws divergent as long as there is enough bony anatomy of Available that it's safe, obviously. So that's, I think, one of the reasons. And the other thing is that I think it's a technical issue that if you um, place your retractor with like a table-mounted arm to keep it in place, I think there is more consistent pressure, which is not necessarily so good. So what I do actually, I tie two umbilical uh, tapes or, or mercelline tapes on my retractor with a little loop, and I hang just merely like half a pound of weight on both sides of the neck. So there is on my shadow line retractor with the feet nicely underneath the longus cola muscle there is posteriorly directed force and not laterally directed force of course you have some traction on the on the retractor but you know with a good soft tissue dissection like we all do i think it does not put additional undue stress on there and because they're just little tapes with a small amount of weight it's tiny but it just holds it in place there there is some dynamism there and it prevents persistent traction against that esophagus and i think that that makes a, di a big difference so i'm happy to share some pictures if people would would, would want that the beauty is that these, these little tapes have a little loop on them. So you take them off, you put them on a little mosquito, you move your retractor, you put them right back over um, the little round connections that the typical shadow line or equivalent has to be able to keep it in place. So that's just sort of a technical pearl of not having consistent high pressure against the esophagus. And then divergent plating with V3, being able to move the plate a little bit where you feel it's ideal fit. And, um, and, and you know, eventually, hopefully with um, the standalone device, once it comes out, um, it becomes a non-issue, I think, because then you're one and done at each level, and you just migrate distally to get to, to get the rest of your construct done. Perfect. And people are I'm now I'm getting text message questions. Just one one more, uh, but we'll keep we'll stay here, guys, as long as you have questions. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The zero profile devices, whether they're the screw based, which we've sp spoken about, and maybe even more importantly, some of the blade based. The question of uh, sort of that uh, you referred as an intradiscal type fixation versus the standalone coming out proud of the vertebral body and on the anterior margin. Uh, what are your thoughts on the biomechanical stability of those for both single and, and multi-level constructs comparatively? Um, yeah, so it's not so much my thoughts, right? We like to do evidence-based surgery. So going back to the graph that we showed earlier, I think any of these intradiscal um, uh, fixation devices are biomechanically inferior to anything anterior to where the ALL would have been. Um, ideally, it's attached to the implant itself because biomechanics that creates the, uh, the most stable construct. Um, um, so um, I, I noted in a lot of people's hands, these sort of, you know, blades going in there and the zero, zero profile devices have been working.
working um, and on an N is one basis. You know, I'm not here to speak that, you know, one thing is inferior compared to something else, right? But I think if you truly look at the biomechanics and if you don't extrapolate it over doing, you know, hopefully hundreds of these a year, um, there is going to be a difference undeniably based on the data that, that we know is out there. So I think uh, it still comes down with, you know, good technique, good decompression, having the ability to place an implant exactly perfect to that uh, to that level and then um, uh, you know anterior to the to the spine putting your fixation is biomechanically better so that would be my uh, my, uh, my my ultimate choice and I think uh, hopefully with uh, the standalone device it's going to prove that uh, it puts all of these things together in one package and it's going to be um, a very efficient way of, of accomplishing what we need to do in the uh, in the OR. Perfect. All right, everybody. Uh, Dr. Pulse, if you want to pull the slide back up with contact information, um, I'm certainly available for any technical or sales or distribution questions. Uh, and Dr. Polster has been generous in providing his contact information as well. Um, you know, thank you everybody for your time. Um, uh, if anyone would like to share this presentation, we have been recording it. So if you have, uh, you know, colleagues or counterparts that weren't able to join, let us know. We can share the presentation. Uh, stay, stay healthy and stay home. See Absolutely. you in Very good. Thanks everyone for uh, for your attention and uh, indeed, you know, stay healthy and uh, and do the right thing for for your family first, and then hopefully for the community next. And um, I look forward to seeing everybody back on the front. Thanks so much and and have a great day. Thank you, everybody.